We might as well get started. A few more people may be walking in here. Just wanted to welcome you to the City of Bloomington Utilities Residential Stormwater Grants presentation. This is actually the second of three that we have uh, this year, 2020, and we'll be getting a little bit more of the history as we move through the presentation. Next, please. And we'll be doing introductions and uh, going over the grants program. Talk a little bit more about the background on Bloomington's watersheds. Residential stormwater practices, in other words, best management practices, what you can actually do in your yards. Uh, and then we'll go into the question and answer session. That might be actually the longest part of the presentation. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll adjourn and we can take more questions afterwards as well. Next, please. Uh, this is Kelsey Petonia. She's our, what we call, MS4 coordinator. Municipal separate storm sewer system. We'll get into that a little bit later. <laughs> Not really something you need to know about that, but you may be hearing more about it over time. And uh, Kelsey actually oversees this project, and I'm starting to learn how to basically help her with it and take it over from there so that she can get on with her other duties. And I'm Christy Lindbergh. I'm actually the Utilities Stormwater Education Specialist and I take care of other programs as well. We'll talk about them along the line. And tonight we also have our <laughs> intern. Thank you, Emily Baca. <laughs> yeah, yes, our um, projectionist here. So with that, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, again, this is the second of three presentations. They're all the same. You can attend all three if you want. As a matter of fact, I think, think some of you were at the last one. Uh, the first was this Saturday at City Council Chambers, City Hall. Tonight is obviously in Banneker. And then we have one more, and that's coming up on um, Wednesday, February 19th, same time, 6 to 7 p.m. And that one's at another Bloomington Parks and Rec facility. That's at the new Switchyard Park Pavilion. Who's been there? Yeah. Very nice, yeah. <laughs> we don't count, right? <laughs> no, it's very nice. All these facilities are wonderful. We're fortunate to have them. And um, just so you can uh, ground yourself a little bit here, there are a couple deadlines that you really need to keep in mind for this program. The main one is uh, April 1st, April Fool's Day. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> and that's at 5 p.m. We just need everything in by that time. And then Preceding that, on March 1st, 5 p.m., we have an optional letter of intent, and we encourage everybody to do that. We'll talk more about that along the way, too. And, and don't worry, you know, you can take some notes, but we'll go over everything in um, detail, and also it will all, this presentation and more will be put on our new Stormwater website. We're really kind of amping up the efforts here to work with people and help them with this challenge that is before us. Next, and everything will be submitted to our new stormwater email. <laughs> and that email, incidentally, stormwater at bloomington.in.gov goes to both Kelsey and I. And um, you can, we prefer you to um, submit them that way electronically, but you can also um, deliver them to our uh, actual office, which is 600 East Miller Drive. It's actually Miller and Henderson, right down there by. Um, Bloomington High School South, not too far. Everything in Bloomington is about five, ten minutes away from each other. <laughs> okay, next. And um, this looks like the place where Kelsey can take over. We're just going to kind of tag team it with you tonight. All right, so uh, last year, um, I started in January 2019, and a few weeks after I started, my uh, supervisor had started telling me that we were going to do this program and it needed to happen pretty quickly. So we had um, a bit of a late start last year. We're getting a bit more ahead of it this year. Um, so last year we just had one public meeting. Um, the dates were about a month later than they are this year. And it was a great first experience. And so I'm excited to um, do the second round of this in 2020 with you all. 
the purpose of the program is to get some funding onto private property to address stormwater issues. So anything drainage or erosion related on private property. The reason being that CBU does not work outside of the city right of way or outside of their, our utility easements. Um, if there's a problem on private property, it is the responsibility of the homeowner to address it. If there's stormwater infrastructure on private property that is um, you know, marked as private, then there's oftentimes a drainage easement associated with it. And we can look up all that information with you if you have any questions on it. Um, so this program is a way for us to help out our um, private property owners, help get some funding um, to incentivize a lot of these drainage fixes. Um, and uh, well, we're here to help you along the way because it is, it can be um, overwhelming. A lot of these projects are very expensive. Um, and so we're hoping that this program will at least start to plant the seed in some people's minds or if not get funding into their hands to um, do some of these projects. Um, so this year, uh, we've doubled the amount from last year. Um, we have $70,000 total to allocate for all the projects in 2020. Um, so a lot of them are um, going to be fairly small grants. I can get into this a little bit more when I talk about the individual practices. Um, Okay. So uh, last year, like I said, we had $35,000. We had 26 total applications, totaling over $167,000. We had some pretty large proposals, um, so it kind of shifted the number pretty high. But um, we still uh, had quite a few projects. We could only fund $35,000. Uh, so we had 11 projects that we chose, so less than half were funded, unfortunately. That's why we doubled the funding for this year. Um, last year, we had four rain gardens four driveway culvert projects, one dry creek bed, one ditch stabilization and rain garden kind of combo project, and then one drainage improvement project. Project costs range from a little under $500 to over $5,000. Some of the smaller projects are gonna be small rain gardens that homeowners can just ask for the materials for and do it themselves. Um, or the larger projects is when you get into actual pipes and infrastructure. Dry culverts are um, one of the examples where um, the, the pipe itself can be a few thousand dollars and based on the drainage area, the size of the ditch, the complexity of the project itself, it can get pretty expensive. So um, that's a general range for you to think of. Obviously projects are probably, you can get quotes for more than that, but that's a, um, just to give you an idea of what we saw in 2019. Yes. Are you saying, is there a cap no. for each one? Okay. There is no cap. We understand that each situation is unique. You can have a large project, multiple homeowners, and so um, we understand that you can submit proposals for greater than that. We're not gonna give a cap in funding. Uh, the review committee, um, when we get into the project review, um, we try to fully fund as many projects as possible. So. Um, 10 out of the 11 were fully funded, and the 11th one we worked with them and their contractor to make something work. So, um, yeah, there is no cap. We are not cost sharing, um, so to speak, so we're not doing flat rates for anything or caps. Um, we do give more, we're going to give more guidance on driveway culverts because those can get pretty complicated based on some of the finish work you want to do. I'll get into that in a minute. So, okay, any questions so far? Just feel free to raise your hand or, or just ask it along the way. So um, for eligibility, we're keeping it the same as last year for single family residential homes. I know that all of our problems are not isolated to single family residential properties, but that is how we're managing the program for now. And we are absolutely going to consider um, expanding it in the coming years. But um, that's a decision that is going to be made by a bunch of other people. and. Um, it's just how we're, it's just an easier way to manage it. And once you start getting into different types of properties, the management gets a lot trickier. Um, and down the road, we, you do need to maintain um, these features. So that can just get a little bit more complicated. So we're just going to work through how that is going to happen in the future. So if you have um, projects with multiple property owners, we just ask that they are contiguous so they're all right next to each other or you know, they can be behind you as long as they're all touching each other. That's considered one project. Okay. Next. Um, for eligibility, they do need to be within city limits. So if you are not sure, yes. 
Actually, I have a question about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. If um, you get, if you're working with multiple uh, neighbors, yeah. but they don't want, they agree to it, but they don't necessarily want to be involved, can you be the mm -hmm. the spokesperson, or do you, yeah. you have to get signatures? What do mm -hmm. you? Is that a part of the process? So yes. Yeah, so for the application, we're not requiring your neighbor's signatures, but by Signing the application, you're certifying that yes, I have their permission to do this. Um, we do ask for one point of contact for each project, but when it comes to the grant agreement, we will need their signature on that. So there will, they will need to agree to do it. We can't have the project happening without their permission on their property. Um, if you have a question about whether or not you're in city limits. Um, we have the website bloomington.in.gov slash mybloomington. Type in your address and it will automatically pop up and say yes, you're in city limits or no, you're not. Um, if you are not in city limits, Monroe County does have a similar rain garden program where they'll um, give you up to $2,000 for a rain garden. So there are resources outside city limits, but this program is specifically for folks within city limits. So once you decide that you want to submit an application, I recommend the first thing you do is start looking for a contractor to complete the work if it's something that you're not going to be doing yourself. Um, we're not going to, unfortunately, we, we can't recommend certain contractors to you or tell you um, how to do something on your property. Again, um, we don't work outside the right-of-way typically, so just for our legal reasons, we're not going to be telling you how to manage um, your specific property. When you're looking for a contractor, I just recommend um, that you look for their experience if you're not familiar with the company. Uh, for a lot of these smaller projects like rain gardens and dry creek beds, you can look at a lot of local landscapers and um, ask them to see if they have experience working with drainage type projects. And you can ask them for specific examples, um, just kind of peek into their, their work history and see what their company is about and see if they're capable of doing this type of work. Um, ask for uh, references as well and make sure that they're insured. Those are some typical um, words that you want to uh, start hearing when you work with the contractor. So once you have your head wrapped around what kind of project you want to do, um, start at working with your contractor to get a, a project design, get a cost estimate, get a quote, um, and then start filling out the application. So. The application is just one page front and back. We have copies back there. You can fill them up by hand or go on our website and do a fillable PDF. We're just looking for your name, contact information, the property you've been working on, um, what your current issue is, and then how you're proposing to fix it. So fairly straightforward, hopefully. But if you have questions on how to fill a section out, just feel free to let us know. We are also asking for um, for some um, supplemental materials with it. So in addition to that one page form, we're also asking for a location map. It can be just a screenshot from Google Maps or something. Um, just really quick so we know exactly where the property is and ideally where on the property you're gonna be working if it's especially a larger parcel. Um, some photographs of the current issue. Um, I like to say if it's uh, raining or something, you know, in action where you can really see the uh, problem. Uh, those are always great. We also will accept videos. Um, we did that last year, and those can be pretty useful as well. Um, asking for a plan view sketch, so like a bird's eye view of what you're planning on your property. Um, you know, if it's a rain garden, this example here, they're showing their property boundary and you know where they have the trees. They're showing the edge of their house where the water is coming from, their downspouts are kind of discharging here. Um, and so just kind of the lay of the land. And you just want to see that you're thinking about it and um, that you have an idea of what you want to do. This was one where they're doing, um, the, the homeowner is doing the rain garden themselves. They're just asked for funding to buy the materials to do it. If you have a contractor doing it, then they can provide this for you. And I could just say many contractors will do cost estimates um, at no charge. Some will charge a little bit of a fee, but most of them that I've heard of will do it for free. Any questions so far on, yes? Um, what if your property, like one of your neighbors or do it in the city? Then you can give us a call. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything on 
not city property. Um, depends on what department in the city owns it. I think it, what, when our property and where we have the most drainage issue is the alley right behind there. Okay. Housing the neighborhood. Okay, like a, like a right of way? Yeah, like I don't know how that comes okay. into the. Yeah. Still, um, yeah, you can you know send us an email with your address and say and ask us to check it out. Mm -hmm. I'll first look to see if there are any um, public utilities around there, like if there's um, like CBU owned storm infrastructure. Um, for alleys, some of them can be vacated or not. I'm not sure what your situation is, but um, yeah, and then do a site visit and see you know what the lay of the land is and see where the water's going, and then you can. Uh, if there's something I see that the city can take care of, then I can go through the channels to, you know, talk with the maintenance crews, either our department or another department. Oh, I don't know you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If it's something in the right of way, then yeah. definitely let us know. If there's something else, um, I'll just tell everyone that you notice on um, publicly owned infrastructure, like in the right of way, if it's a storm drain or something like that, we do have the U Report app. If you just Google U Report Bloomington. Indiana. It's a web page where you can go in and put in um, either like a complaint or a, just a concern, maintenance requests. If you see something, it can be not just drainage related or utilities, but um, you know, um, a broken sidewalk that you trip on or something, or a stop sign is. Uh, that's probably a more emergency. You should probably call someone else. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, yeah, just minor things that you notice that you want the city to pay attention to, you can do that. So, um, all right, anything else? So, um, April 1st is our deadline this year for um, the applications to be submitted. Um, Chris, you mentioned that letter of intent. We do. We are strongly recommending letter of intent. We tried it last year, and I think it worked really well. The folks who submitted letters of intent, it was just a good way to get the project in front of us sooner. And so I can do a site visit. I can talk to you know some other folks internally to say, hey, have you worked on this problem before? Um, or yeah, just to give us more time to look into it. And the more that we talk about it, the more we can maybe catch some red flags sooner, whether it's a note on eligibility or ways that we can improve the project. Um, so that really helps us. I will say we did, I mean, not, you don't need to submit it, so it doesn't mean that you're not going to get awarded if you don't submit a letter of intent. But it def definitely does help us screen them early. Uh, so once we have all of the applications last year, it took us a couple months to get through the review process. Um, we had a five-person committee to review them. Um, it, we had three uh, city employee employees and two members of the public on the committee. We had someone from CBU's engineering department, uh, someone from planning and transportation, it's also on the environmental commission, and then um, a member of the utility service board, and then two members of the public. So it was a great crew. They took time either out of their work days or you know their, their private lives to spend time on this, and we would meet for like one to two hours at a time. It took us a couple different meetings to get through everything. So we had to meet and actually just go through all 26 applications, talk about the projects, and get familiar with what they were presenting to us, um, and then go through and rank them and find out how to rank them since we had never done it before. So we had about three meetings um, where it took us to finally make our decisions. I had ended up doing some kind of like a staff review where I compiled all the information, um, made tons of spreadsheets <laughs> to try and get it all in a good presentable format for everyone to see. Um, and I think we're going to follow that more so this year. So I'm going to work with our engineering department to spend some more time just doing a staff review and doing the things from the desktop that I that I can like compile all the information on your project. Um, that way, the review committee will have everything in front of them, have an easy time to be able to sift through them and uh, re and rank and review them. So we'll be looking at um, the location and the drainage area. Um, Proximity to uh, like a creek or a waterway, um, well, other stormwater infrastructure. Each one is unique, so this doesn't mean if you're, you know, directly discharging into a stream, that means you're going to be highly ranked. Each one is going to be really different, so it's just more information to consider when we're reviewing them. Uh, potential to uh, reduce flooding or protect, you know, some structures, improving water quality, um, any potential benefits that uh, the project can have. And then we're also looking at uh, median neighborhood income levels. We ended up doing this last year on GIS with the census blocks. 
just looking at medium incomes for neighborhoods. So this year we're going to be pushing more for lower income neighborhoods. We want to make sure that um, we are um, getting some funding out to, to some of our underserved communities. And the review committee is going to take all the information and make their selection from that. So like I said, um, it really, uh, looking at feasibility of the project, we want to see that you've thought about it. Put some care into your application materials. If we think that you haven't just thought about it enough or it doesn't seem like the plan is actually going to work, that could you know, bump you down a little bit. So take some time with it. Talk to your contractors or um, give us as much information as possible. Next. Um, so once we make the selection, we will award projects. We will get an email from us to say, yes, congratulations, your project was selected for funding. Um, or if it wasn't, you know, we're happy to talk to you and see what we can do to really improve your project or what we can do for next year. Uh, awarded projects will be required to sign a grant agreement. It's a fairly short grant agreement, just a couple of pages long, just outlining a lot of the legal requirements that we have. Um, it's fairly minimal, fairly straightforward. Um, I work with the folks from HAND and how they do it on their um, community grants. Um, we'll need signatures from the property owners, any property owners involved with the project at that point. It's just going to say you awarded this much money on um, this date and you have one year to complete your project and then you're going to sign up for a five year maintenance period. Um, I'm not sure how I'm going to enforce that yet, <laughs> so it could be, you know, I just might give you a call in a couple of years and say, hey, how's that rain garden doing? Do you mind if I come take a couple pictures? Something along those lines. Do we need to include our maintenance proposal within the description? So I asked for that in 2019, and some of it was useful, but other folks, I mean, they thought about it, but maybe it wasn't exactly what I was looking for. So um, I, had, I ended up putting an appendix in all the grant agreements for each practice, just a general statement saying, these are the things that you're looking for to maintain. A lot of it is if you have uh, like a rain garden, you're going to be weeding it and make sure it doesn't get overgrown. Um, if you have a, like a French drain or a pipe underground, make sure it doesn't get clogged. For driveway cul culverts, just check it before and after big rain events to make sure it's not blocked. Um, just checking for damage to the pipe, um, you know, some of the basic, basic things. So we just can't have you like, you know, spend five thousand dollars on this big project and then next year be like, oh, whoops, I don't want to do it, and like. It. We just need to make sure it's maintained for so many years, but five years is what the committee decided to, to stick you to. Okay, so we don't need to specifically say anything in our application about what we're going to do. No, if it's a consideration you want to include, you're welcome to. The more, the more info, the better. Okay. okay. Um, and then all payments will be made in arrears, so this is a reimbursement program. Um, if you want us to pay a contractor directly, we can totally do that. Um, I have worked, I've done it both ways with our 2019 projects. Um, we either can reimburse the homeowner after they paid the contractor to just get them done, or the contractor can send us an invoice directly and we'll pay them. So either, either way. Yep. All right, so next I'm gonna change gears to Christy. If you have any questions so far on just the general guidelines for the program, Thank you, Kelsey. I thought maybe you were Christy because I got Christy's card when I came in. Do you have your work card? Well, because we said to email you questions. Oh, um, you can write stormwater at Bloomington.in.gov. Yeah. Okay. It'll go to both of us. Yeah, we talked about that earlier. That's okay. okay. <laughs> Just a reminder to the others, too. And um, we thought we'd go into a little bit of education, basically kind of why we're doing this, too. Get you grounded there again and learn a little bit more about our stormwater here in, here in town. But first of all, I like to start a lot of presentations with this slide. It says, the nation behaves well if it treats the natural resources as assets, which it must turn over to the next generation, increased and not impaired in value. That was um, Theodore Roosevelt back in 1910. It's just kind of a nice thing to think about while, while moving forward. We actually took that in our nation's um, capitol building. So next, please. Look at that picture. Who remembers uh, February 7th of uh, last year, too? 
<laughs> That's probably why a lot of you are here. We do as well, and we're just kind of expecting a little bit more of those events as we uh, go through these next few years. And um, this is kind of just a, a typical view of what can happen when we have increased rainfall that falls within a shorter period of time. Next. Basically, Bloomington is in the middle of two what we call watersheds, and those are areas of land that drain to a particular body of water. Um, the northwest section drains basically north and west over to the uh, west fork of the White River. South drains basically south and west to the east fork of the White River. Eventually, they meet further down southwest in the state, become the White River, then they go to the Wabash, <laughs> and further down to the Ohio that makes the squiggly line at the bottom of our state, continues south and west, uh, all the way over to the uh, Mississippi and eventually Gulf of Mexico. So what we do here helps us and people down there and everyone along the way and everything along the way. Next. Again, February 7th, Kelsey and I were actually at a stormwater conference learning about our changing climate. And uh, the next thing you know, about an hour later, all of our phones were going off with these warnings that Bloomington's basically underwater. <laughs> so um, we kind of took heed and moved forward with some of our other projects and with more vigor. Uh, next, basically it's, it's happening. Our climate is changing. We are expecting more periods of intense rainfall, punctuated by more um, periods of drought, if you will. And um, you can kind of see that happening already. And fortunately, our mayor and city council are behind this as well. Next. And we're moving right along with some of the programs where we had. and. Um, strengthening others and creating more. Others that we have are the storm drain marking program. You may have seen some of these little decals on the storm drains that ask you not to uh, dump into um, storm drains. Basically, the only thing that should go into storm drains is rainwater. And um, adopt a stream is another one. That's one that we share with parks. So you can go out and adopt a stream if you have a stream near you. Think about that. We have um, a training coming up in a couple months. And of course, residential stormwater grants and adopt a drain. We have the flyers back there, and uh, that's where you can adapt a storm drain by your house. How sweet. <laughs> and basically, we ask you to help us keep that clean so that we don't get flooding like we saw in some of those photos. Next. And um, adopt a drain is just a, a very good new program, and um, let me know if you are interested. We can talk about that a little bit more later. Next. And uh, here we go. This is uh, another area for Kelsey to step in and talk with us a little bit more about our best management practices that you can do on our property. Thank you. So now I'm going to just go through a lot of the common practices that we've seen either for these grant projects or things um, that we think are good residential practices um, that we can implement with this program. If you have any questions, again, along the way, just let me know. Um, I just have one slide each, so I can keep talking more if you want. <laughs> All right, so rain gardens, bioswales, dry creek beds, uh, detention and retention ponds, which are the permanent stormwater features for larger developments we have in the city, either dry ponds or ones that hold water all the time. Uh, ditch stabilization or driveway culvert replacements. Next. So rain gardens. Um, I've learned a lot about rain gardens <laughs> since I've started this program, and, um, and I've helped build them before and whatever, but um, seeing the different scenarios where you can uh, put them in is really interesting. So a rain garden is going to be an excavated bowl, basically, at least a foot deep. It may look flat from the top, but the actual work to install it is going to be requiring a lot of digging, or for the larger ones, you can even bring in like, maybe a little mini excavator. Um, so you want to excavate your little bowl. It can be bean-shaped, it can be round, it can be whatever, or triangular, whatever it needs to be, depending on your landscape, um, at least a foot deep. And then you're going to have a little berm around it to help capture that stormwater. 
and you're going to backfill your garden area with what you call either engineered soil or um, soil that you can add uh, sand and compost to to make it really good at infiltrating and also just really good for those plants. Uh, we recommend native plants because their root systems are just going to go a lot deeper. They're going to be much better suited for this type of environment. And your rain garden um, should be really good at infiltrating water. They're not meant to uh, hold water for more than 48 hours. It should drain pretty quickly after your rain event. They're going to capture the water and get it down into the ground as quick as possible. So um, don't put them, as a rule of thumb, less than 10 feet from your house or foundation because you are trying to get water into the ground. Uh, but they're a great way to um, capture the runoff from your downspouts or and you know, if you have an area that's draining, maybe your neighbor's backyard is draining into yours or something like that. Um, they're a really great tool. And if you have a larger drainage area and a lot of water, you can engineer them to get them to be pretty big and handle a lot of water. Um, if you have a, a large one, we can also put a under drain in it, so a perforated pipe underground. And that'll just help with the infiltration for those larger rain events. Um, if you have, say, like an inflow point where you have pipes, like your gutters or something, going directly into it, um, you can uh, make some pretty landscaping features through there to guide the water through it. If you have a really large one, um, we recommend putting a stable little outfall area, so a stable area for the water to overtop so it doesn't completely fill up your rain garden for large rain events. Um, there are a lot of different considerations, and so some of the smaller ones uh, can definitely be done by hand. Dig it out with a shovel, you know, grab some friends or something. Um, get your good topsoil mixed in with some sand and compost. And uh, um, I recommend at least four or so species of plants. Um, don't go too overboard because when it comes back next year, you want to be able to identify those plants. So clump them all together so you know what grows up where. Um, and uh, the weeding is probably going to be one of the harder parts of maintaining your rain garden and not letting it get too overgrown. Uh, that berm, you can also plant on the berm where you can keep it grass or mulched, some, whatever, is, uh, whatever you choose to do. Um, so some species that are really good in rain gardens, um, things that can handle water. So in your really wet areas, you might find blue flag iris. Um, that's a really pretty one. Um, purple coneflower can be along the perimeter a bit. Um, it can handle the water, but also might be a little bit better in the drier areas. Uh, dense blazing star, we have some of those in our rain gardens outside CBU. They're really fun. The long purple spike of flowers. Um, Golden rods are probably going to come up in them no matter what, but um, <laughs> you can weed those out or keep them. Um, just don't let them take over. And then uh, we also have like sedges and rushes, so like a brown fox sedge or something like that is also really good. And you can, there are certain plant lists you can look up. I know Monroe County has a nice rain garden starter guide that, that'll list some of these things for you. Um, so any questions on a rain garden so far? A big overview of what you can do with it. All right, next. So bioswale is, to me, I think of it as a linear rain garden. Um, it's really similar in that you have the same type of engineered soil, uh, native vegetation, but you often find them um, along like roads or linear projects. So they're going to be conveying surface water. Many times they'll also have an under drain because they're going to have larger drain drainage areas. Um, so lake rain gardens are great for uh, pollutant removal. If these are getting stormwater directly from a road, for example, that's really important. Um, and I think I said all of that. So a lot, a lot of the same plant species, uh, different management considerations, if it's right next to a road or something like that. But um, the same idea as a rain garden, just meant for conveying the water through um, that bioswale, not so much as a bowl like a rain garden. Any questions on a bioswale? Okay, next. Dry creek bed. Uh, this is an area that had a failed dry creek bed. There's water going in it right now, but dry creek beds are meant to convey water just after rain events. Um, this was right after a rain event, so there's water flowing through it. But um, it's uh, not as complex as a bioswale because there's not going to be that vegetation component to it. But um, you'll also often find this in the landscaper's lingo. That's what I've learned. Uh, they call them dry creek beds. Just meant to have a way to convey the water in a stable manner, so you'll often find them filled with stones. Um, 
if it's faster flowing water, you want larger stones. For smaller drag free beds, you can have smaller stones. Um, for you can use round stones or angular stones. The angular stones are going to be better at kind of splashing the water around and slowing it down a bit, but the round stones look pretty. So it's, that one's up to up to you on design, but uh, it's just another way to um, convey water through your property. Next. Retention and detention ponds. Um, a lot of these get into my MS4 area if uh, if they're part of, say, a, a large development or redevelopment project. The MS4 requires that for any developments, one acre or larger. So we have hundreds of these ponds throughout the city, and most of them are privately owned. It's uh, not unique to Bloomington. This is how most municipalities operate. So these large retention and detention ponds um, are meant to not only slow down the flow of water, so they, uh, they aid in flood control, but some of them also can um, remove pollutants from the water and have that water quality benefit. Um, but many of the ponds are probably reaching the end of their useful life. If they haven't been maintained really well, you might see some issues in our ponds around the city. So we're also opening pro the program up to uh, these as well. If it's in a single family residential community, um, there's a lot of things that we can do to help with pond maintenance. So we can work on um, better vegetative buffers around the ponds that can help with water quality and erosion. Um, any other type of vegetation management, um, if there's erosion at inflow points or things like that. There's a, a lot of either smaller projects um, that we can help with, some of the really large projects as well. Um, I know that a lot of communities are struggling with that. So. Um, I will say the retention ponds hold water all the time, and then any flood capacity is going to be anything above that normal pool level. Detention ponds are usually dry. It's a good way to remember it. So those are normally dry. They'll fill with water for large rain events, and then they have a control structure to slowly let the water out. So, and driveway culverts. So driveway culverts are mostly privately owned, and most of the time they're right up against um, publicly managed ditches. So it's a, um, that point of the public-private interface between the, the stormwater management, where if you have a failing driveway culvert, um, it can really cause some bad erosion upstream and downstream. It can cause upstream flooding. Uh, your driveway could obviously suffer a lot of damage if your pipe fails. So this one here, if you can see at the bottom, is completely corroded out. The driveway started to buckle. There are a couple of suck holes that had started forming. So. If it's a really large pipe, um, they're going to cost several thousand dollars just for the pipe itself. So we'll pay for the removal of the old pipe and the new pipe and the installation, just the basics. If you're looking to do some fancy <coughs> head walls and wind walls and concrete work and all the finishing stuff, um, that'll be the responsibility of the homeowner. But we will pay for the bare minimum. We're gonna, we'll get the pipe replaced and all that for you. Um, so let's see. So these um, also, we do ask that we have a pre-construction meeting. So if you have an awarded project for a driveway culvert, we'll be meeting with our uh, CBU's engineering and then your contractor just to make sure that we have the correct pipe size and material, the elevation of that, where the water goes in is correct because that can all, even if it's just a few inches off, can mess things up. So uh, that will require a bit more planning and coordination, but we know that these are uh, really important for the overall management of our, our ditches. So. Um, any questions on the practices so far? I can talk more if you want. <laughs> well, okay. All right. Um, I think we'll just wrap up and take questions. So as a reminder, uh, submit your applications uh, to stormwater at bloomington.in.gov. That goes to both Christy and myself. Um, or you can hand deliver them. Your deadline is April 1st at 5 p.m. We're happy to come out and do site visits with you. We'll meet with you um, during business hours, or if you have you know, scheduling needs, we'll work with you on that. So um, let us know if you have any questions. Yeah. One, um, do we have to, before submitting the application, make sure that the contractors are vetted by the city? Um, we thought about doing that, but <laughs> The way that it ended up playing out, so we um, can do one-off payments 
So the perk of working with CBU is we already have our own billing system and all that for our stormwater billing. So um, even if the contractor is not vetted, um, we can do one-time payments. And that's how we pay back the homeowners as well. We'll just do a one-time payment. It takes a little bit longer to process because it needs to go in front of our utility <coughs> service board. Um, but we can do that. So. And I'll be out working with them. And I, you know, Christy and I can inspect the projects to make sure we're getting what we all agreed on. So. And then um, with our proposal, mm -hmm. can we, knowing that there are maybe many proposals and uh, different priorities, can we say that we want to do ours in different phases, in mm -hmm. like a 2020 phase, 2021 phase? And we'd like to have the whole thing funded, but if not, mm -hmm. award us phase one or phase yeah. two okay. as a possibility. Yeah, I don't think we can guarantee funding from one year to the next. Right. If you have a big project and you say, you know, this part is really our top priority, um, the committee might be able to break it down that way. That was how we handled that one project that um, wasn't fully funded. They had a few different elements to it. And we said, you know, this needs to happen. We really want you to put this rain garden in and how can we make that work? And we said, you know, this other part is not a top priority for us, so we ended up doing it. So we kind of broke it down that way. Um, I can't, like I said, I can't guarantee funding from one year to the next, and we've been giving everyone one year uh -huh. to complete the project, so. Okay, but we could request the, the mm -hmm. whole project, but yeah. then you I think say that's... you would agree to this, mm -hmm. and then we can reapply. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. We're allowed to reapply for phase two, phase mm -hmm. three, if it's not funded. Yeah, okay. I think that's reasonable, but yeah, put it, put it all in front of us, and we'll see what happens. Okay. Okay. Any questions either specifically about your um, project or about the program itself? Yes. So the situation on our property uh, is, seems sort of complicated in my mind, and partly because we have easements from the city on three sides of the property, and okay. one of those is for drainage, but that hasn't functioned, I think, like it's supposed to, perhaps. Okay. Um, so it seems to me like going forward, we might need to be in communication with the city yeah. to help so that we can, like, even if we talk to a contractor, I think they're not going to understand all the dimensions of, like, unless uh -huh. the city's also communicating. I don't yeah, know. we can meet with you first, and then so you can have all the information there, and um, yeah. Or if you want to put us on an email chain with a contractor there or, or something, whatever we would do out, yeah. Um, if you want to email us with your address or something and say, can you check this out and what's going on, you can look at our utilities layer and just see what we have there. And, yeah. Okay. You mentioned French drains. Um, mm -hmm. Under what circumstances might you fund one of those? Um, so we did have an application for French drains. Um, I don't think we funded any single project where that was the only component of it. Um, but if you can add in some other, like uh, other uh, feature to it, say you are going to be doing a French drain from your downspouts into a rain garden or something. It's I know uh, property size can be limiting in that sense, but um, if you add another feature to it, it might make it more competitive. Um, but it's definitely a, a drainage. Uh, tool that I think is pretty important for a lot of people. So, yeah, there was one project that incorporated a couple of French drains going into a rain garden, so. So if, if the problem is basement flooding mm -hmm. um, and you want to get the water away from the house, mm -hmm. yeah. what would you have to do? What would be ideal, an mm -hmm. ideal project that you might find? Yeah. Um, so, just going by the lay of the land, you're going to be directing those downhill, and then if there's a space on the lower part of the property where you can um, either d divert it to a rain garden or um, or any other type of like stabilized, I don't know what features you have on your property, but if there's an area that you want to, um, you know, do something with it as like a out outlet or something, I don't know. Um, Something that would be just discharging directly, you know, into an underground pipe or something. Um, we want to try and find more creative ways to slow the water down instead of just conveying it in pipes directly um, to the street or something. So um, it's hard to say, just you know, without seeing the sure. particular situation. But um, is that good? Okay. 
I'm going to say send us an email because it, it might take us some time. Um, like I said, this is uh, not the only part of mine and Christie's job, so we just work with our schedules and so we'll have to, it's better to do it by email so we can look at our calendars. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Great. And we probably going to be scheduled over the next few weeks, so. Work? Yeah, that's fine. I have a lot of questions, and I feel like they're all really property specific. Sure. <laughs> so, just to follow up on that last question, yeah. protection of property and structures is an element yeah. of the considerations as mm -hmm. long as diverting water from damaging structures is not diverting it into somewhere where it will do as much or more damage. Yeah, in there's, way. there's no law that you know, stops you from dumping water onto your neighbor's property. It's like, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a whole, it's a common entity kind of thing. Yep. Uh, we're all managing it and um, it can be conveyed by CDU's infrastructure into private infrastructure back into CDU's infrastructure. It's just kind of the nature of it. You know, we, we can't keep it all in the streets. We don't want it all in the streets. <laughs> um, we can't do any work directly to like your house or something like that. You know, we're not going to be putting sump pumps in people's basements, but if it's something where we can direct your downspouts or, like I said, you know, capture it uphill before it goes to your house or something, so that's what we're trying to do. What about things like sump pumps in a crawl space? Is that a valid? Yeah, no, we, we won't be working inside your house at okay. all or, no. or working, you know, won't be okay. doing improvements to foundations or anything. Only on property outside. Yeah. yeah. Structure. Yeah. Okay. But if it's, if, you know, you know, you have something that's flowing directly, you know, into your yard and right in, yeah. you know, down into your house or something, yeah. and we include that. You know, okay. the committee will take it into consideration, or um, for sure. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So um, I'm actually here on uh, part of my uh, neighborhood association, and it's, yeah. we're talking about um, problems we're having in our, our local park. Okay. Yeah. And it sounds like this is meant mostly for individual property owners and yeah. not the sort of projects that we have in mind. Yeah, if it's on the parks' property, mm -hmm. um, send me an email anyway. Okay. And yeah, we'll we'll get together and, and work through it. I've I've talked to um, some folks at parks about I think about that specific park. Probably. Probably. <laughs> but yeah, um, the parks department just hired a new um, urban green space for a person to help on certain green infrastructure type projects just for the city parks properties. And um, they have some great staff who can help with some of these issues. And I think um, I want to coordinate with them to make sure the utility side is still good. And so, yeah, send us an email still and we'll work with them. Okay. Any other questions? All right, well, um, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> it says a uh, uh, median income of the area is how How is that? Uh, you don't need to provide that to us. We'll get that from the census data. What's your source? How do you determine? So we go through the census data. Um, that provides uh, median income on census block groups. And that's the finest resolution that we can get from the census data. And if we do anything more stringent than that, then we'd be going through income verification, which I think HAN does, but we don't have the staff or knowledge to do all that. It's a lot of work. So we're just going by, just in general, this is the median income for the census block group, and all that information is available um, to the public. So that's how, we, that's how we're doing it. Okay. If someone wants to be in our committee and help us and do something more stringent, I'd be <laughs> welcome to ideas, but that's how we made it work last year. Any, uh, anything else? All right, you, you have our contact. So thank you all for coming, and um, good luck with your projects. All right, have a good night.